Okay, so we are in session 24 today and uh, we will cover XML in this session. So we'll start with an XML overview followed by um, several, couple of very important use cases of XML uh, in the real world which is RSS, SOAP, Atom, XHTML, WSDL and so on. So we'll walk through these five of these very important use cases in the real world and the XML terminologies uh, starting with this markups, elements, attributes, tags and so on and validating an XML document using a simple web browser how can we validate and uh, well-formed XML versus valid XML uh, and the XSD overview along with the uh, DTD which is uh, document type definition and uh, we will we'll, uh, revisit our uh, MDI parent form which we have created in the previous session. So we will see how can we integrate the MDI form uh, with the child form. So how can we navigate and implement all of that and we extend, uh, we extend that MDI uh, multi-document multi interface uh, project to implement a file search implementation. So we extend our code. Um, in the previous session, we did see the how to recursively iterate through the file directory. We will extend that to implement a file search implementation. Uh, we'll see that overview uh, in demo and, and general. And also, we'll extend that to implement a print document uh, features by using the system.drawing.printing namespace, uh, wherein we use the print document and the print page event handler to handle the printing functionality along with the print preview dialog and also a print dialog. So we'll see how can we do all of this in uh, WinForms and also starts with an XML overview. Okay, so let's roll off session 24. Okay, so today now, uh, so today's topic, main topic is a system.xml namespace and uh, so we start with the definition of what is an XML. I hope most of you already know what what an XML stands for, and XML stands for as an extensible markup language. Just like a HTML, we already know HTML stands for some kind of language, which which is a hypertext uh, markup language that's used for the the basic uh, uh, text in which uh, the the content in the internet is transferred, and the browsers can have browsers have built-in interpreters or parsers which can um, uh, parse the HTML content on the browser. Similarly, HTML is a different standard uh, which is dedicated for a specific reason and we'll see what. And why again XML we have and what's the purpose of an XML and what it contains again. So it has a set of encoding rules defined in the XML 1.0 and 1.1 specifications produced by three, uh, W3C and hope you already know uh, this uh, basic internet fundamentals when anyone talks about the basic internet fundamentals they usually talk about the W3C which stands for World Wide Web Consortium. It's a governing body or the standards body which governs the, or regulates the standards or approves the standards for the uh, anything that supports the internet in, as an infrastructure. So which comes uh, along with a lot of uh, protocols and also the transport layers or the, the standard way of the messages that need to be encoded and things like that. So we already know what W3C stands for. And so XML is a specification or a standard that's, uh, that's an approved standard uh, uh, produced by the W3C as a, uh, as a group. And so it, it doesn't belong to a proprietary right to any company like a Microsoft or a uh, or some microsystem. So it's a standard, just like a HTML and XML is a standard. And currently uh, the versions that we have, as you see, the version 1.0 and also 1.1. So that's what it stands for. Um, and what it contains. So it contains, although it's originally the XML as a, a standard, it is designed to or it is uh, its main focus is to uh, represent a documents uh, just like an H HTML. So that's the reason why I'm actually referring to HTML and uh, that's the reason because the HTML is also a document uh, which is the purpose of the HTML document is to uh, render the information over the internet and the XML is also kind uh, is also a standard for the same purpose originally it is designed to do. 
but because of its uh, uh, very flexible nature, it's more used to represent it, represent as an arbitrary data structure. So in general, so if you know the data structures, right, uh, is a, when we talk about the arbitrary data, data structures, we mean to say that uh, any uh, data that you represent, like in a, in a database as well as a relational database model, we have a database where you have a table with rows and columns, and uh, that's kind of a data we're we are talking about. And using XML, uh, it's ideally best uh, format uh, fit to represent any type of um, uh, such kind of arbitrary data structures. So it's widely used uh, more than uh, just a document, but it's more than uh, it can be used for uh, storing data as well. And so where it is used right now, so that's the question. So where all the it's used on the internet? So the first major candidate for XML is the, so one of the major candidate is the RSS. Hope you already seen what is RSS in most of your uh, internet browsing, wherever you go through applications, do have a very uh, strong uh, integration with the RSS feeds. So RSS, what is an RSS? It's a really uh, simple syndication, which it stands for really simple syndication, RSS, and it's uh, widely used as one of the one of the type of um, format used in the web feeds. So we all know what is a web. Of course, a web feed is a piece of information that can be fed to another system. Uh, either uh, the other system, it's a simple like uh, if you have a client and server model, and the client in this case is an RSS reader, which can sit on any device. Uh, it could be on your machine or a tablet PC or a mobile device or, or even um, any any application any, that you can write. In simple, I have uh, open up the Outlook Express here. So this Outlook Express do does have the RSS indication here. So what it does is it ha it subscribes to a couple of um, publishers online on the internet. What they do is whenever the content uh, modified uh, or content a new content is placed, they just um, because my Outlook is subscribed to those um, web uh, content um, management tools. Uh, in this case, the Microsoft. So the information in this case is just, just news articles or any blog entries that, that, uh, that comes in whichever I subscribe to, that will be uh, pushed into my uh, RSS reader. In this case, the RSS feeds, the RSS reader is uh, uh, tightly coupled into my Outlook. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the RSS feed. And you will see this RSS very often, especially when you do with the blogging sites. Uh, and those kind of sites, so you'll definitely see the RSS feeds, and it's very, very um, powerful. And of course, so there are uh, new enhancements in the down the uh, down the line. And we currently we have an RSS version 1.0 and also 2.0 version currently, and it supports only plain text and HTML uh, as a payload, as a payload in the sense of the content that it can support. Um, so that's about the RSS. And of course, XML is tightly used inside the RSS. That's where it's been used. And of course, we already know what SASU protocol uh, stands for, Simple Object Access Protocol. It's completely in XML. So it's, in, uh, again, so don't go with this um, uh, icon here. The SOAP is not exactly the legal uh, SOAP icon. There is nothing called a SOAP logo that you can show. But for RSS, this is the logo that you see. Um, so just I put something like a soap bar. It's a cartoon soap bar, but doesn't have any implication to the soap that we are talking about. Um, so, so the soap is a protocol, uh, is a specification that is used for the exchanging of uh, information between the two endpoints in a web services, and that's a very, very common, a very, very important thing. And soap normally will have a, a, a an envelope called a soap envelope within which it has a soap header and a soap body. And we'll see uh, when we talk about the WCF services and where in the message contract, usually when you refer to, you can actually uh, customize a message contract to represent a, or create a customized SOAP envelopes uh, that we can do in, uh, in the .NET as well. So we can see even uh, the WCF 4.0 has the type of services which can, which, using which you can actually create a syndication services which are similar to the RSS. Uh, fields that we are having here. 
The next comes the atom. The atom is again, um, whenever people talk about atom, it refers to two different things. Uh, one number one is the atom syndication format and with respect to the XML as a usage, uh, we talk about the XML syndication format. Another one is an atom uh, public publishing protocol which is also called atom pub or app in simple so this is also similar to or it's not actually similar to it's actually another another format used for the web feeds again so the atom is is actually is a recent one which is uh, published in 2005 uh, again, it's again a governing body is a W3C, and the purpose of atom, in, uh, atom, in other words, uh, sorry, the the atom came into picture to just replace the RSS in general. Uh, the reason being there are a lot of limitations with the RSS, the the feed that can be supported. Uh, just in case, uh, or as simple as the it supports the plain text and HTML, but in the today's world. Uh, the internet is filled with a lot of uh, rich media, which is uh, uh, video files or video streaming or the uh, audio files or rich graphics and so on. So, uh, and it, RSS doesn't really support uh, such kind of rich media and hence the Atom in place. So Atom actually supports a very large set of uh, content formats and also it supports a wide uh, language uh, language as well whereas RSS doesn't support because it comes with a plain, plain um, text. And of course the Atom supports multiple languages. It uses the XML to represent multiple languages again. Um, and so the Atom replaces uh, RSS in general. So that's the, uh, so Atom is the latest um, uh, format, the syndication format uh, for web feeds. And it's again XML format. And the next comes as X HTML. So we're just talking about the XML versus HTML and now that comes an XHTML, which stands for um, Extensible Hypertext Markup Language. In general, as we just spoke about the HTML, uh, HTML prior HTML5 again. HTML5 is again a mix of uh, multiple things, uh, which supports a rich media and rich uh, graphics and other things. So HTML5 is a mix of XML versus, uh, plus the HTML. So uh, except HTML5. So otherwise in general the HTML, the uh, prior uh, HTML5, they all implement the standards uh, specified for the SGML. So which is the base for your markup language, which is just uh, SGML stands for standard generalized markup language, which is again W3C proposed the standard to support and it's passed by the browsers using the HTML specific parsers. Whereas when it comes to XHTML, uh, it's an uh, impl uh, implementation of uh, the same document uh, following the XML standards. Uh, so HTML standards are d different from the XML standards. So uh, again, so although both have the same tags and uh, um, attributes and elements, but XML has its own specifications and it's more uh, a strictly subset of SEML, in other words, it has a more strict data types within which uh, you can enforce, whereas HTML, HTML you don't have kind of enforcement of a specific format that you can enforce, whereas XML can uh, can also be used for a wide variety of contents. It can also uh, transfer um, cross-language uh, media information as well as the the binary information encoded within the XML file. So it has a, it has a wide variety of uh, usage. And to, in the, today's world, XHTML is most um, uh, mostly used for, especially for those applications which are rich uh, media content uh, information. And it, as a best example, if you see, I can compare a couple of um, uh, websites that we normally see on a day-to-day -day basis. A couple of websites like the Wikipedia, if you see. The Wikipedia, if you go and see view source, So if you can see the doc type here, so the doc type is an XHTML doc. So the Wikipedia uses the uh, XHTML as a format for rendering the internet doc, uh, internet files, and also the um, the Hotmail here. I just, just have a couple of uh, uh, things open here. Oops, sorry, I'm going the wrong place. View source. So even the Hotmail does make use of the XHTML. Uh, version 1.0 and uh, and of course Yahoo is actually a different thing. Yahoo doesn't use the XHTML in this case. Uh, 
Okay, so yeah, we are exactly HTML content. So you, we have applications that can render uh, either XHTML or HTML. So you, if you pay close attention, then you will see. And Hotmail, uh, in this case, uh, seems Hotmail is uh, more than just a mailing services because uh, we still have something called SkyDrive. It has a do rich documents that you can support, a rich media doc content. That, in other words, so hence uh, the XHTML is a uh, best fit there. Then hence it's been used. And um, and uh, yes, uh, HTML is uh, of course the desktop browser needs the XML sorry HTML parser, uh, whereas the XHTML it needs the XML parsers to read the content and uh, show it in the browser. And the last one, but one of the this this these are some of the major uh, uh, known uh, protocols or the infrastructure that we normally see in a day-to-day -day programming life which makes use of the XML. But this is just a, a portion of a large usage uh, when you talk about XML. XML is today, in today's world, it's used more like a, a database itself. You can make use of uh, it's the database itself. And the last one here is the WSDL. We can, uh, of course, the WSDL stands for the Web Service Definition Language, which we will see when we do the WCF uh, programming down the line. Uh, when we have an example created in WCF, we'll see how what the WSDL looks like. Uh, it's an XML-based language again, and it describes the functionality that's offered by a web service. And usually, this is the WSDL that need to be published for the client to consume into their application, and that will carry all the information of your contracts that you specified in the WCF, which, uh, which again includes your message contract, service contract, within which it has an operation contract, and of course the data contracts and its data members and so on. So all that information is uh, uh, published to the client to consume in the form of a WSDL. Okay, so these are the various usages of uh, system.xml, and here comes the terminology. Um, so when we talk about the XML terminology, there are very few set of uh, keywords that we normally see when we talk about an XML document. And uh, one of the first one is the uh, the, the the whole document itself uh, has two parts. One is the markup, another one is the content. Uh, and the markup and content, the characters which make up an XML document are divided into two, uh, which is the markup and the content. The so markup is all the strings. Uh, and characters that begins and ends with um, the angle brackets. As we see, the whole document, just like uh, HTML, it starts with, with these angle brackets, and uh, and any text will be embedded within these two elements. And uh, in the, in this case, also if you see, uh, good morning, and it's uh, uh, with the, embedded within the uh, two tags. So the XML is completely like this. Unlike, unlike HTML, HTML you, even just you put any plain text without any tags, it's good to go. Whereas XML, it follows a straight formatting rules. And the, that's what the markup is all about. The markup is with the angle brackets. Always see the markup and the content. The content between the two uh, markups is, is a content. So the XML document, in general, if you look at, it has a markup and a content. And here comes the tag. So what are tags? Tags do have, um, in in other words, we whatever you see within the angle brackets, um, that uh, de, uh, defines the tag. And it has three types of uh, tags in general. One is the start tag, uh, wherein within the open and close angle brackets. In this case. So the open and close angle brackets and a name in the uh, between them. That's called a tag, and this is called a start tag, and uh, the followed by the end tag, which, which is it's going to have a forward slash. And it, this is a very standard thing that we normally see with HTML, and as well if when we talk, when we do the uh, ASPX programming, it also comes with the same thing. So it's plain XML uh, format. I hope most of you already know about this. If you know HTML, it's very similar to HTML. And again, another one is an empty element tag, which uh, um, which has a self-termination, uh, which doesn't have a begin and end, but it can be self-terminated. This indicates that's an empty tag. Okay, so whenever you see this, it you can refer to this as a tag, which is similar to HTML. 
and what's an element uh, element in this case uh, it's a it's a logical uh, document component um, that either begins with the start tag and tag and, and ends with an end tag and all else with an MTA tag so in this case uh, anything that has a start tag and an end tag uh, that's called an element or if it is self terminating which is an empty element that's fine so a couple of elements we have here so one is the root element so again in XML so that's one of the key constraint is that the XML document must have a one and only one single root element okay so it, uh, if you have multiple root elements then it becomes an invalid XML that's one of the key standard specification and of course uh, it starts with an XML declaration on the top uh, that's the first line that goes and if you even if you don't provide this information the parsers will uh, take it as an implicitly as a version XML version 1.0 and then encoding format as UTF-8. So as I mentioned, so with an XML, actually you can uh, you can have any rich media content um, yeah, and that you specify based on the encoding. In this case, UTF-8 simply stands for a plain text and a text format that you are having within the XML content. If you are carrying any binary format or rich media content like the video file uh, within the XML, then that becomes a different encoding altogether. So there are a set of encodings that an XML can support. Uh, in this case, we are looking at the UTF-8. So that's the first line of statement that goes in. And if you are actually generating an XML document on, on a fly uh, that another system need to consume, then this first tag is very, very important. Without this, the other systems cannot actually uh, uh, consume it unless they are designed to consume by default. By default, that means another, if at all you don't specify any encoding format, um, so the, the respective passes, if they consider as a default encoding as UTF-8, then that's fine. Um, in most cases, the application is designed, if you programmatically do, then this, is a, this tag should be there. And of course, we are talking about the elements. In this case, the, the root element will have only one and one, only one root element. You cannot have more than one. And the child elements within which the within the root elements you can have any number of child elements. In this case, the person under persons we have a person, and similar to this same person, you can actually have any number of uh, persons within this. And also, need not be same person. You can also have a different uh, element as well, like a greeting here. You can also have this way. It's a valid format uh, as long as we have the root element. And uh, of course, we'll come follow through the slide and the attribute. And the attribute is the uh, markup construct consisting of a name value pair. In, in this case, um, within this element person, which has a, a start tag and an end tag. So this is an element. And within the element, I can specify uh, within my open uh, uh, angle bracket and closed angle bracket, I can specify a list of attributes to that um, person. And in this case, I have, this is, if you visualize this, this can be representing within your a class uh, inside your C sharp code, uh, wherein you can, a class can have multiple properties. And in this case, it's the same, you can visualize this element just like a class. Or it's not a class, it's an actually object, because the, it's, it does have the attributes and also it has a values. So a uh, person, in this case, the nationality is one of the attribute and it has a value. It's a key value pair, in other words. And a sex and it has a value, an age and a value, name and a value, an ID and value. So this, if you visualize this, this is more like uh, a data table content. In this one, you can visualize as a person as a data table and uh, each item here, each element here can be referred to as a record in a database. But of course, um, Things like uh, a database uh, a table can have only a standard structure wherein you can have only a fixed number of columns and their data types. But in this case, if you visualize this person, it has a, a, some other elements as well which may not be matched into the person alone. But this is that's the slight deviation. Uh, otherwise, it's you can represent uh, XML just like your table data table content. So that's about the attributes. So attribute is the elements or component within the element 
which has the key value pair combinations okay using which you can actually uh, carry forward the data elements and of course the root element we just talked about the root element and XML can must have a root element otherwise it's going to be an invalid uh, XML so a couple of rules we can uh, actually uh, uh, see uh, if you want to really create uh, an XML file in this case uh, what I was talking about the first tag my say my XML it's just a plain text and I'm here I'm going to say person persons in other words and say persons within this I have a person person right so it's a self uh, of course uh, this has a termination here and I'm just going to give one ID is equal to 100 and name is equal to of course within quotes I'll say I'll keep my name so that I don't have any problems if I use someone's name so that's the reason I always use my name so if I use someone's name then they might have a problem okay fine and uh, another one I'm just creating a sample um, XML file here and just it so I did not put the first tag which is the um, the encoding first line so will this be a valid XML so I just close this how do I, how do I verify that it's a valid XML or not all I need to do is just uh, rename uh, my file to an XML extension and just open this in the browser so if you see this um, XML version the first tag I did not put this tag but of course the parser on the browser will by default implicitly presume that uh, this is maps to a version so unless I specify what content it has what kind of encoding it's having it's fine so the parser, respective parser can default it to the respective version. But again, if I go back to my file, did my, did my uh, browser modify my file? No, it doesn't. So my file content will be same, but the browser will interpret that as the respective file format. Okay. So this will, uh, in some cases, the respective system, whenever if you generate a file out of your code, then you need to really make sure that uh, the first line is emitted otherwise it depends upon the parser if they might uh, take it as a default otherwise they might throw an error okay and again so this is the easiest the simplest way to validate is using the, the the XML parser which comes within the browser and if at all if I want to validate if my XML is correct or wrong in this case I will make an invalid XML and what is invalid so if I remove this code there so I just removed the opening quote double quote uh, that's the only thing I did and I saved this file and I go back here and refresh my page so if you see there's nothing so the browser has a tolerance that if it, if anything breaks then it doesn't uh, throw you an error but just the content will not be shown will that be a same case if I make this as a HTML document I'm just going to open a new file, create a new file. Okay, my HTML. Open this and okay, I'll just keep it as is. Save that and HTML. Okay, that's fine. And what I'm going to do is double click on this. no content output so it does recognize that there is a content within this file which cannot be passed even by the HTML browser okay let me I need to now open with the notepad and now the notepad is gone I have to go back and look into my notepad browser I'll say those Windows system 32 and not bad do we have okay perfect now 
no not always okay so now in this case I'll just say hello world so HTML is fine if it is just a plain text so it's HTML parser is uh, again different from XML parser which again uh, your browser is uh, coming with the same thing and I hope okay it opens with the notepad which makes my life a little easy and now I fix this page uh, file and again refresh this it should be good so what it what we just demonstrated is the how the parser in the browser really recognize the content of the file okay so XML is open using the XML parser whereas the HTML files are open by the HTML parser okay and that's the simplest way if at all you want to validate a given XML just open it in the browser if the browser is able to pass it your XML is good to go okay and this is a kind of an XML that you can look for uh, it comes with again the first one the encoding tag with the, uh, the, with the, uh, with the first line stands with the version and the encoding tag and they followed by the content in this case I have a couple of uh, persons uh, with the names IDs and other things so this represents an, a valid XML and uh, just give me a second okay And uh, that's that. This is one of the very simple XML that we are looking at. And uh, the XMLs can be very complicated. In this case, I have a parent-child relationship in this XML document, and uh, the 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 nested nature of an XML elements can go into any number of uh, level. In this case, the, this is my root element, and uh, this is my person element within which the person element can have another set of elements. Uh, in this case children and children has another element and it can have collection of child elements within the children and uh, of course within the persons I can have collection of persons so you can design a XML file which can represent uh, multiple table data into the same single XML file so the because of the the format in which the XML is designed to work with it's very rich and very convenient for um, representing data uh, as a flat file okay and that's the reason XML is being used uh, more than uh, just like a document it is used more than uh, even to represent the arbitrary data structures in this case and in our examples today we're going to see both these examples uh, how to read such files and how can you validate um, XML documents and so on and uh, using gshop.net and there is a critical thing about the XML. Uh, one is a well-formed uh, XML, and another one is a valid XML. In interviews, people do normally ask. Uh, normally, they won't ask what is XML. Most probably, uh, what they usually ask is what is a well-formed XML and what is a valid XML. And that's a very likely question to come in. And uh, uh, well-formed XML is an XML document that adheres to the XML specifications. A couple of specifications we just uh, saw in a demo wherein the attributes need to have a value with the double quotes and the root element should be only one and, and so on. So it's a standard structure, structure wherein each the, there is a definition how the tag should look like and uh, how the element should look like and standard structure in which the XML is, uh, uh, language is defined. In, the, in this very example, we have the, this is a well-formed XML wherein I have a starting uh, element, uh, tag and an ending tag which represents that both the names should match exactly the same and of course here also I have another element with the starting uh, tag and the ending tag followed by the same name. If the ending tag name is again a mismatch uh, then it's going to become a not a well formed because in this case this is not a well formed XML but that means this one does not adhere to the XML specifications which is in this case we are referring to the specifications of 1.0 which is the base specification we also have 1.1 again and uh, in this case as we clearly see um, persons and person this becomes invalid because the internal element itself is not a valid one we just uh, saw in one of the example is that entropy doesn't have a double quote one of the double quote I removed and it becomes it, it doesn't uh, stand anymore a well-formed XML 
In, in simple, your answer will be whatever, whichever the document that adheres to the XML specifications, which is XML 1.0 or 1.1 specifications, then that document is can be called as a well-formed XML. And now what's a valid XML? Okay, so these are just a, a basics we are talking about. We will jump into the code and then we'll make use of these same terminologies down the line. Okay, the, so the valid XML when you start with, uh, it starts with uh, an XSD. So what's an XSD? An XSD is uh, in the, in other words, it's a type definition. In the uh, earlier, it used to be called as a document type definition. And if you see even now uh, DTD, in other words, we just saw the DTD. When we open the source, view source, Okay, so it has a DTD specification. Uh, in this HTML, it has a DTD. So this is what a DTD stands for. This is the uh, document type definition, which has these certain uh, rules governed uh, for, with which your document should adhere to. Again, just like an XML. So, um, so th because since this is the XHTML, it comes with a DTD. So that the content of the document need to adhere to the given DTD specifications. And in uh, if at all you're referring or if at all you're making your uh, uh, XML document that representing your custom data, then you can come with your own definition for the document which is called as a XSD. It's called an, let me go back here. <coughs> which is called an XSD, which is called an XML schema definition. So, so you understood what's the difference between a DTD and XSD. So DTD is a type uh, document type definition, which is again uh, referred to the older uh, name. So to, uh, the reason, uh, the new name for that is an XML schema definition, which is called XSD. And if at all you have your own custom uh, data that you want to validate, then you will come up with your own XSD, so like this. So this is a schema definition which we are talking about and uh, this one again it uh, follows the same UTF-8 standards and what does this have? Uh, this has the specifications that what the content of your document should be. Okay, In this case this definition talks about the content of uh, the same sample file that we have seen just now and uh, which refers to what we have here. So if I have an XML file like this this is a well-formed XML, no doubt, because it follows all these XML uh, standards adhering to the version 1.0 and very well opens the My Internet Explorer, that means My XML parcel, which is good. So what makes this as a valid XML? This should be a valid XML only when this, the content of this document satisfies the definition of the, uh, definition of the uh, content. In other words, the XSD. If I have an XSD for this document created, then this uh, should be validated against that XSD to become a valid XML. So in this case, uh, what I have here is, um, I'll freeze this here. So what I have here is this content here. Let's match to the, the XSD definition that we have. So this says that this one has a root element called person. Okay. Uh, so in this case, it talks about the same thing. It says the root element called person, right? And this root element person we already have here and the name should also match again, persons. And what it has internally is an, another complex type and its complex type uh, name is person, okay? And the same person I have in my document here also, perfect. And this complex type, is name is person, of course the person matches. Now what is the definition of this person now? It has an ID. So it must have an ID and of course I have an ID. And it should take a, a, a value, it's a required value. So it, there is a value here. And also it is an unsigned byte, it's a data type. What we see right now is the complete business rules or the constraints applied on the data. So what we are seeing here is just a validation rules, just like in any database constraint that you apply. Okay, this column should take only this type of data 
and of course this is not null or required things like that okay in this case I, I say required or optional and also I have a complete rich set of XML uh, data types in this case string unsigned byte and so on so this is the XSD definition so if you know database constraints and all how your database table looks like you can very well understand the XSD document there's nothing complication about this document and uh, and if you ask a question so how to really create an XSD document uh, then the answer is very simple if you have there are X tools in other words so we have a command line tool that you can make use of uh, to create an XSD document for a given definition okay in real world how, how things happen um, is that you come with the uh, XSD uh, first and then create an XML document one way. Another way is you can come with an XML data first and then create an XSD for, for that document. So the tool that we can make use of is XSD tool. So this is a tool that you can ideally make use of to create an XSD for a given uh, document. Ideally, let's, let's take a close look at what this XSD can do. So this can take an, another XSD uh, and uh, validate your given XML document and also it can take a, an assembly your .NET assembly which is a DLL or EXE and generate an XSD for the content in in other words if you have your domain object model like uh, the person class defined and compiled it you can use the XSD to generate an uh, XSD.EXE to generate an XSD document for that given DLL so you don't have to really uh, memorize or or keep track of okay I have a new set of data types now then I have to really uh, brainstorm my learning curve to know all these data types no certainly not you don't have to remember any of this you just use your own known skill set which is your C sharp language or if you know the XML expert then you can straight away create this XML document uh, using any tool like your notepad as simple as notepad you create an XML, doc, uh, XML document and then use your tool to generate the XSD okay and uh, this is the command line route which you can make use uh, of these again in this case we have an uh, XML as an input document to create an XSD and also XDR okay so in Visual Studio again, uh, again if you're not a, a very fan of uh, the command line stuff there are GUIs for that that means a graphical user interface for that uh, in this uh, example I have a file oh, this is my complex uh, file so in Visual Studio how easy it's in Visual Studio I don't have to even go to the command line uh, if you have, and again this uh, XML uh, plugins uh, varies for Visual Studio versions since I have Visual Studio 2010, it has a very rich support for XML. Of course, 28, 2008 also does have, but I'm not sure about 2003 and earlier versions doesn't have uh, good support. But earlier versions, uh, you have uh, third-party tools. Called, one of the most popular tool is XML Spy, and you might get introduced to XML Spy uh, down the line if you get into any job. Uh, that's a very well used tool, and there are a couple of more uh, very wide range of tools available for handling XML which gives you a you, uh, graphical user interface wherein you can uh, create uh, uh, XSDs and XML files uh, without having any idea about uh, the tags and uh, all these values okay in the in Visual Studio we'll quickly jump back to the Visual Studio and if you see once uh, again this uh, menu item will not be available uh, unless you really have an XML document okay for example, if I go to my CS file, that if you see, the XML is dynamic. That's gone. Okay, so that will appear only when you have a proper uh, XML file and uh, highlight it to that. Uh, in this case, I was actually referring to another one. Yep, this one. Uh, then you will see the XML menu item. Okay, so that's a little dynamic. So don't uh, waste time searching for that. Uh, once you highlight on the doc document and go to the XML menu items and say schemas or in this case the create schema that's the one click it takes to create the schema and now the schema is ready for me 
okay and if you are good in creating XML in this case since it's a plain uh, uh, document you can actually right away create this file by hand or use any other tool to create it and uh, once you do it you can get the XSD and this becomes your thumb uh, thumb rule or document or a validation document that can fly to your respective vendors who can make use of this file to validate the data that's coming in and ensure that the data file that they're receiving uh, is valid. So that become that makes your XML file valid. So that's about the valid XML. So valid XML can be a well-formed XML but it must valid against a given schema definition which is called an XST, okay? And now we will quickly walk, jump on to the topics for the day and uh, we have a, a very vast list of topics and since I already have the code ready, uh, I'm going to quickly jump into and uh, walk through. And in the previous session, we did create an MDI form uh, with the child forms, but we could not, uh, we did not integrate that uh, from the menu item. So today we have an application, a very well running application. I'm going to run through that application first. So this is an MDI form. So what we did do is uh, integrating uh, these commands with respect to forms. So now I have this uh, integration done. When I said new item, so it's prompting for uh, new file. I'm just quickly demonstrate the code and then walk through, walk you through the integration, how these uh, uh, forms are integrated from each other. So in this case, I'm going to create a new form and I'll say 100, probably 100 is not there and save. And uh, in this case, uh, I'll just hit say something, uh, hello, hello world and I hit save and I see the uh, the status file saved successfully. So now it's pretty much like a full-fledged uh, application wherein I can do a maximize and, and I have this whole uh, workspace to work with. I can do anything within this. I can put uh, the whole uh, document with some text. I can uh, probably pick some very good text from here and uh, do a copy right click and copy and uh, of course paste it. So I have even added the context menu here since if you remember this is just a text box, text box which doesn't have any abilities to do just like any uh, copy paste. In this case I have the, added the context menu item uh, wherein I can do a paste. So it, as you see it did not actually replace the whole text that I have here. Uh, instead of um, you know appending to it. So that's again flaw in the code but it's not designed to, uh, perfect to work with that. And I'll just hit save and I hope this file is saved and how do I know? Let me open the same file and see. Test files So yes, I can see the content very well. So that means the files got saved. Another interesting here is the windows I have, uh, if I want to see all these windows and I can see them side by side. And also I have something called title vertical. I can align these uh, documents uh, vertical and also title horizontal. I can also see these documents both horizontal and this one has some why again I think it's not resizing the way I'm looking for but that's fine so the other one either both of them are the same the screens but this one has some limitation probably so again so what we are trying to demonstrate here is the how the integration happening now in this case what happened is a new file I'm able to work with open a document and save a document okay so all these commands got integrated with my form and how did I do so we'll walk through the code now. This is an XML, IO operations. And uh, yes, the last time we did do the file directory demo and I have a little more uh, enhancements there. I will walk you through that. And uh, we'll come back to the uh, MDI parent. And with an MDI parent source code, how did I, uh, okay, we'll walk from the here. 
okay this command click uh, show new form what I did is the getting the uh, file that we are picking for in this case I have the uh, filters added up to the uh, initial di your, your uh, save file dialog wherein I have added the filters um, to pick only the files that we are looking for uh, how does this work is uh, run this and hit new so if you take a look at the bottom part so this is the filter that we have added up and this will also do a filter on the content that I'm looking for okay and once we do the if condition here the if file dialog we see if the okay uh, is checked that means if at all you uh, try to open the window here and say cancel that's what we're actually checking there if you say cancel then it is not going to go for a get the name okay and uh, once we've done that we get the file name that's been picked by the user and then we navigate to the uh, form in this case the stream read uh, stream reader writer demo and what I see here is the constructor so I made use of the uh, custom parameterized constructor here to pass the information that I picked from my parent form okay in this case I'm passing the the file name and the action so again this file mode is my custom enum it's not a, a predefined enum in this case um, I'm actually tracking whether it's in a uh, new or open one so open an existing one or a new one okay so in this case I will uh, leave it uh, as is as a save um, and uh, if you want to quickly jump into the definition how does it look like it is my public enum defined here uh, which is open and save in this case I, I did not specify the number otherwise I can also do a, a give a number like this okay which is also fine okay or I can give 10 or 11 whatever it's if we remember enum although you see these uh, names as a uh, human readable names uh, enums are numeric types by default so this is one basic thing that people normally don't uh, uh, keep in keep it in their uh, memory uh, because by usage wise we always see a uh, text part but internally they are actually numeric and what happens if I don't specify it takes the numeric defaults which is 0 and 1 okay so this is one of the item that we uh, discussed uh, while talking about the enums long back okay so this is how the uh, integration is done we just create the instance of the respective form uh, and uh, so and associated the MDA form uh, to the current one and then hit show that's what we did so this is a basic uh, class uh, initialization or uh, instantiation and making call of that so that's what uh, the integration is done and if I jump into my definition of my form so this is a constructor we know the constructor uh, it matches with the name of the class and it doesn't have any written type so that's in the case that this is a uh, constructor and of course this is a partial class we did discuss what is a partial class and in uh, Windows forms as well they are partial and similarly just like a web forms web forms are also the code behind is a partial class using which I hope, hope you remember I just want to recap again on uh, what's a partial class using partial class you can uh, split this form implementation across multiple physical files but still we can uh, so that multiple developers can work um, on this on this form simultaneously so that's the purpose of having a partial class at runtime it's going to be representing only one single object at runtime and when I, I just pass these two uh, parameters to this uh, constructor and wherein I'm actually checking uh, doing the rest of the operations because I have the file name to open and then I'm, I'm just if it is an open mode then I'm actually reading the file content and uh, uh, populating my text box and open file in this case um, go to definition I'm just using the stream reader the way we used last time and uh, returning the content okay if any exception happens and it's just written now nothing else and uh, when I hit save file I'm just using the simple these three lines of code wherein I'm using the stream writer to write the file content we just walked uh, through this um, last time
Okay, so that's all. This is a simple implementation within my uh, form, and that's what we just demonstrated, and it works pretty well. And what next? File search implementation. So this application, whatever we have done, I have just enhanced this to implement a very useful one, uh, which is uh, file search. So in the last example, we did actually uh, iterate through the directory listings and uh, in this case the same directory search I uh, made it to implement a search tool okay and uh, I just added this part here what this is do doing is by default actually I hard coded this path otherwise I can also go back to the uh, same uh, test files and hit OK it works the same way and I'll uh, search for .NET because I just now I saved a file uh, with the .NET and I see my file that I have created in the last uh, demo I can see that file here so this is a search mechanism which is actually traversing through the all the roots nodes or the subfolders within this parent folder and looking for all the files which is uh, having a txt as an extension and it's opening the content of the file and then matching to the search string that I have given here and whichever matches it's listing that here and not only this what I have done also is if I hit on this I can see that file is opened okay and I see the .NET keyword in this file and uh, if I demo this for something else I'll say I probably I have something like uh, your yeah there are a couple of files I'm not clearing the old uh, output hence I see that it's getting up updated here and uh, if I hit this can I see that keyword your yes I see that your keyword so how are, how difficult is uh, this to implement so we already done most of the part in the last uh, session itself and uh, what addition I did here is uh, pretty simple one is of course the same directory path where you're going to search for and this is the going to browse through the folder and the new thing is a search string and the output as a list item uh, as a list um, list box and uh, what I'm implementing within the search uh, is um, if you see the same piece of code which does the search directory which iterates or recursively iterates through the given parent uh, parent uh, directory in this case watch directory uh, that's the name they just misspelled and uh, what it's trying to do is it's going to iterate through the file info of the respective file it's opening the it's opening each of the file as a stream reader and checking and of course another important thing is it's actually getting the files with the given filter that means in this case, sorry, in this case it's looking for only for the TXT files, okay, and getting at the file because because if I want to make use of the uh, stream reader and uh, opening that as a text file and trying to compare, so I'm pretty much expecting that to be a text file, okay, and no no binary files like image files and other things, and uh, once I have the content read to this content local variable. I'm actually using the content.contains which is a string contains method available passing the string that is in the search strings and I'm just making it too lower so that my search is not case sensitive and if this returns true then that means that um, the file whatever I looked up uh, has the key that I'm looking for and hence I'm adding that line item to the list so this is just this piece of code that making um, be here like a search engine so it's not that complicated it's pretty simple and the rest of the recursive algorithm we already know we did talk about this in the last one wherein we are call, making call of the same search directory for each of the directories available within the given directory okay get directories and for each of the directory info we are iterating through the uh, directory if it doesn't if it has any uh, child directories okay otherwise not otherwise it's going to end up with uh, uh, endless uh, or infinite loop so that's the file search implementation uh, it's pretty pretty simple and what else I have here and the next one is the printing so how difficult is 
it to implement a printing uh, here. So I'll just start a demo first and then we'll um, okay and uh, I'll open the test files and within this I have a file called 100 which I have created recently just now and I open this content here I'll maximize this window again maximize this and now I have these two buttons right the print and uh, print preview I'm going to hit the print preview and what I see here is a, a print preview wherein I can actually auto or 50% so this one is not wrapped in other words so this is a print preview uh, wherein I'm actually yeah I hope if this would have been done to wrap it up it's not wrapping otherwise uh, this is a print preview control I have wherein I can make use of it um, embed it into my con uh, form and call it and it's two lines of code, nothing to do, nothing, nothing to worry, nothing much actually. And it does come with the print option here. And if I print it, if you see it's a standard printing that's happening, it's actually picking my default uh, print printer that I have on my machine. Uh, if I go to my uh, devices and printers, and I have a default printer called the PDF995. Uh, so what this uh, driver is going to do is uh, it's going to uh, convert the uh, the print file uh, to a PDF okay I could either, either use any hardware device to map it since I have this default printer what it's trying to do here is it's trying to convert that into a PDF file so if I just um, okay I'll just take this root path that's fine um, yeah and I'll say since that's a freeware I have to live with some advertisements but this is completely safe uh, it doesn't uh, have a, any harmful virus or something like that and it just created a PDF uh, document for me out of my application okay if you have some good content in your file then you can of course uh, very well do it but of course this one has a flaw that it's not actually wrapping down probably I, I have to do some kind of a coding to see the margins and the left margin or right margins and set up my uh, thing uh, I hope I have some margin set up here. It's, I hope it should be readily out of box, but uh, prob probably we need to do some research on that area and get it done. So this is the print preview functionality I have in my application. And in addition to that, instead of going to print preview, I can also directly go with the print. Okay. In this case, what I have here is the print dialog. Uh, normal standard print dialog that you see wherein it has an option to pick the respective printer on my whichever is on my desktop and I can pick the respective one and uh, hit print it's the same thing and also it has the properties wherein I can hit that and it takes you to the normal standard proper uh, your windows printing uh, standard way the print properties comes up it's the same thing so everything is there out of box for you to use it and in this case I just pick the same default printer so that it's easy to see the content that's coming out and hit this and uh, should see the same dialog open and hit the okay overwrite and the same thing works good so I have a print preview and also the print button to uh, directly pick the respective print device and hit the print so what it uh, how much code it takes for me to implement this okay we'll go through that and uh, that implementation is inside my MDI parent wherein I have the print button here okay and uh, where is this yeah this is a print document here if I click this I'm making use of the print document as a class and I have the PD and the print page is actually mapping to the content of my uh, page in this case I actually made use of this uh, uh, print page event handler which uh, we will walk through this is if you take a look at this it's a delegates so this print document is actually asking for you to hand have a delegate handler which is an event handler that means this print page is actually as a delegate that takes a handler that implements that and uh, all that implementation what the kind of implementation it goes in so this is an implementation of the respective one it is uh, just a dummy uh, it's actually from the metadata which is just attached to the uh, event handler 
and the event handler is actually here. So this is the method that I'm passing which is implementing the uh, handler and doc to print and this is where my implementation goes in. So what I did in this implementation is uh, retrieving the content of my, doc, uh, my text box and uh, using the respective print font whatever I desire to use. I just hard coded this otherwise I can make a rich UI to select the font and all and finally do the e.graphics.drawing draw string whereas the my e is my print page event object and this will take care of my implementation okay and if I go back to my uh, print here so once I done with the PD I'm just asking the uh, print dialog and assigning the document PD to my print dialog and just print okay if this is okay then just print so this is the line of code that I'm going up uh, just to do the print dialog open. So this is what the print dialog is going to make to uh, is the print dialog. So this is what we need to get the print dialog which will list out the devices that you have on the machine and associate the content that you want to print and then call the print. So it's three lines of code in other words. And uh, what is the code that we have in the preview? So preview again here we have a print preview dialog. So this is another control available uh, within the um, system dot uh, forms. I think it's a control from the forms. We have a namespace here, which is uh, yeah printing is from the drawings dot print is a print doc and print event handler, which is we just saw, and the uh, the print preview dialog is from uh, system dot windows dot forms. Okay. We just made use of uh, those controls. Those are also again available uh, yeah, as a tool set, but in, in our case, I'm actually making use of the code. And it, it does the same way is the print document, get the print document and have the event handler. And in this case, the print preview dialog, assign the print document to this and then show dialog. So that's all it takes for you to implement the printing functionality. It's pre pretty straightforward and very simple to implement print. In this session, uh, we did walk through what is an XML uh, and the complete XML overview stands for the ex uh, extensible markup language and uh, uh, the who, who uh, is the specifications as proposed by the W3C and it's widely used and what it contains and the various uh, use cases for XML in the real world uh, these days uh, such as the RSS which is the really simple syndication. Uh, SOAP simple object access protocol, Atom, uh, Atom syndication format or the Atom publi uh, publishing pro protocol for our Atom Perb, APP or uh, XHTML, XHTML extensible hypertext markup language, the WSDL which is web service definition language. All these are some of the very key use cases for XML in uh, modern age and uh, some of the XML terminologies which includes the uh, markup and the content uh, what is the markup and uh, what does the content looks like all the tags and other things so the, the tags the start tags and end tags and also of course the empty element tags uh, or we did walk through and what's an element and what is a root element especially the the child elements uh, looks like and the attributes to the elements which are key value pair uh, associated to each of the elements within the uh, the child elements and also the yeah, root element is one of the very key uh, root element as part of the XML standard specifications uh, a root element must be there to be a valid XML and also the XML declaration we did walk through and uh, and a very good sample a simple uh, data structure for an XML file uh, we did see and also a complex data structure which has a nested uh, el child elements uh, within a person as an example and a person having children, a collection of children in, uh, as an example that's been um, shown in this slide. And we did see what is a well-formed XML uh, and the well-formed XML is the one that uh, adheres to the W3C specifications for um, the XML. And valid XML is the one that uh, adheres to the data specifications or data type definition specifications or an XSD which is uh, XML schema definition 
uh, given for the given XML document. So if it is adheres to that definition, it stands uh, true as a valid XML file. So this is a very important thing. And we did see what is an XSD looks like, a schema looks like as well. And uh, and we did also cover the uh, MDI form or the child form integration, continuing the previous examples uh, earlier that we have done uh, in the MDI, MDI form and child, child form integration. And we did see the file search implementation of uh, extending the file directory uh, recursive search to the file directory in the previous session and extended that to uh, implement as a real-time usable file search implementation which can take a key uh, search key and look up into the all the txt files within the given uh, file system path and uh, uh, and point to the, all those files which matching the contains the matching uh, search keyword and we did see how to implement a print functionality on a windows form so using the system not drawing dot printing uh, print document and the print page event handler and also we will see how can we implement a print preview using the print preview dialog and the print dialog. And we'll continue with the XML reader and XML document uh, in the next session.